Well, hello, Vineyard Church. How are you guys? Good, good, good. I want to welcome the folks at the Highlands as well. Glad you're here. Uh, I'm so excited to preach today, but before I do, there's a couple things I want to make you aware of that are coming up this week that are worth your time. The first one is uh, on Thursday is the National Day of Prayer, uh, and the National Day of Prayer is all about praying for our nation, and our nation needs prayer. And so if you're a person of prayer, I want to encourage you to take a few minutes anyway on Thursday and pray for our nation. Now, hopefully you're praying for our nation regularly, but take a few minutes to concentrate on that on Thursday. There's also a gathering at Ogilvy at 6.30. I believe there are uh, flyers on your chairs or somewhere available. Um, so if you're interested in participating, there'll be a gathering on Thursday as well. So be aware of that. It's worth our, worth our time, worth our effort. Uh, the other thing that I want to make you aware of is coming up, and I've been saying it for a while now, but you probably aren't aware that it is this Friday coming. We're, we're just a few days away from LeaderCast, and LeaderCast, in case you don't know what LeaderCast is, uh, is a one-day leadership gathering, leadership training uh, of some of the best encouraging, inspirational uh, leaders uh, that you're going to hear from anywhere on the planet, and it happens in Atlanta, Georgia, and it's broadcast to over 700 locations around the world. Over 100,000 people will be gathering on Friday, and I want you to be one of them, and we're one of those simulcast sites. If you go to the, the event in Atlanta, it's $250, $275, something like that to participate. To participate here as a general public, it's $100, but as vineyard folks, because we want to invest in you and we want you to invest in yourself, we have a special deal for you. It's half price. It's $50. That includes lunch, and it is a day of inspiration and equipping that will help you, whether you're a leader, like technically a leader or not, every one of us has influence with our families, uh, at the workplace, and in the life of the church and in our community, and this will equip you to be better at that and shine your light brighter. And so it's worth your time. If you work for somebody, talk them into sending you as part of work. It's worth it. Lots of uh, companies will do that. But listen, this is how you, you get to LeaderCast. You have to get a ticket, and so you can get one in the lobby on your way out. Uh, they'll be for sale. Or get one of these LeaderCast cards. I believe they're on the chairs or somewhere at the, at the Highlands. I'm not sure where they're going to be, but get one of these, and there's a code on the back. You can go and register online. But don't miss this. This is, a, this is going to be a phenomenal day. It really, we've done this, this is the third year, and it's just a fantastic, fantastic day. And when you get better, everybody around you wins. And it's worth taking some time to do that, investing a little bit of time, a little bit of money. And you'll have a blast. It's going to be a fantastically fun day. So LeaderCast, it's coming. Don't miss it. Uh, this Friday, I know you've all been like going, yeah, I need to sign up for that. And they didn't realize that it was now. So it, here it is. So, um, All right. Well, we are in a series titled I Am. We're looking at the I Am statements of Jesus. Um, they're found in the book of John. John was... John was one of Jesus' best friends. John writes of himself in his book, he was the apostle or the disciple that Jesus loved. They were, they were close. They were very, very, very close friends. And there are four books that lay out the, the events of Jesus' life. We call them the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar. They're written to different audiences. Matthew's written to a Jewish audience, and, and uh, Luke is written to a, a non-Jewish audience. And, and so, but those three books, they, we call them the synoptic gospels because they're kind of similar. They lay out the events of Jesus' life. John really, he does that, but more than that, what John is trying to communicate is who Jesus was. He's trying to reveal who Jesus was really was. And so the stories he tells and the way he tells them are, are lean in that direction. And John is the one who over and over again tells us about these times where Jesus says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. And, um, and so Jesus, as we talked about in the first week of the series, is tipping his hat to the fact that he's God because God said in the Old Testament to Moses, tell them that I am. And, uh, and so he's tipping his hat to that. But then he's using these metaphors that just really, in a very poignant way, as we're about to see, describe who he really is, who God really is. And so the story we're going to look at uh, today, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And that's found in John chapter 8. But we're going to start in John chapter 7. So if you brought a Bible or you have a Bible on your device, you might want to open up to John chapter 7. 
because that's where we're going to start. Um, now, we find Jesus at the beginning of this. He is at the temple in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was one of a handful of feasts that the Jewish people celebrated, and in Jesus' day, they would travel from all over the country, sometimes all over the world, to go to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. And the Feast of Tabernacles was to remind them of the 40 years they, they wandered in the desert with Moses, that God set them free from captivity in Egypt, and they went out to the wilderness, and there's a whole, I don't have time to go into all of that, but they, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and God was faithful to them the entire time, miraculously. He brought water forth from a rock. He provided food for them. He provided light for them by, through a pillar of fire that was with them at night and shade for them because they were out in the desert, a shade for them during the day by putting a cloud over them. God provided all the way along. And so the Feast of Tabernacles, they would actually set up tents in their backyards and sleep in the tents all week to remind them of that, that time and to, to remind themselves of God's faithfulness as well. And so one of the things that happened during the, the Feast of Tabernacles was something called the water drying, sem, uh, not seminar, <laughs> ceremony. The water drying ceremony. And they would go out to the Pool of Siloam, and that's mentioned several times in, in the, the Gospels, uh, and it's very rich with history. The water there really represented the presence of God and the Spirit of God, uh, as water did generally throughout the, the Bible. Um, and so they would go out to the, the Pool of Siloam, this big parade. They'd come out of the temple, musicians, dancing, everything. They would go, they would fill up a pitcher with water, and they would come back to the temple and they would pour the water on the altar. Now this is rich with symbolism, and this is important. Uh, this is really important to what we're talking about. The ancient rabbis said of this water drying uh, ceremony, they said anyone who has not seen this water ceremony has never seen rejoicing in his life. They, it was a party. I mean, they were celebrating. It was a big, big deal. And they were celebrating a few things. One, they were celebrating the fact that God had been faithful in the past in providing water for their ancestors in the desert, that he had been faithful that year in providing water, and they were asking God to provide water for the future. But there was something very significant and prophetic about this ceremony as well. In Ezekiel 47, there's a prophecy that the prophet Ezekiel wrote down about water coming out of the temple in Jerusalem and it turning into a stream and going out into the land and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And everywhere it flowed, life came forth. All right, and so this was their, their way of remembering that prophecy. They'd pour that water on the altar, and it was like the water would come down under the altar, and it was a picture of a day that was going to come when that, when that water would flow like that. And of course, water is a symbol of God's salvation and a symbol of the work of the Holy Spirit. And so there, this day when God's going to pour out his Spirit on all flesh, that's really the day that they were, they were thinking of. Now, metaphorically, they're using water... For, for the Spirit of God, and water brings life. If there's not water, there's not life. They lived in a desert, right? Uh, no water, no life. Water, life. Everywhere the, wa the, the stream went, there was water. Now, we don't get this in our, our culture, do we? We don't, we, don't, we don't get the idea of real thirst in our culture. Because what do we do if we get thirsty? We turn on the tap. Right, I mean, we pipe water into our houses. We've, you have probably never been truly thirsty before in your life. Uh, when I was, uh, was in college, I was doing a backpacking trip in the Canyonlands of Utah, and as long as you stayed in the canyons, it was great. Beautiful red rocks and streams that flowed down, and all along the streams there was life, animals, plants growing up. You could get water if you needed it. It was great. But what we would do from time to time is climb up out of the canyons and onto the plateaus, and we would hike across the plateau from one canyon to another canyon. And it was okay as long as you didn't get lost. You had two bottles of water that you could, you know, sip on as you go, and you needed to stay hydrated because hydration is really important. So you're drinking water and drinking water, but you don't want to run out of water. And one particular time we got lost going between canyons. This was the days before GPS. And so we're going across the, the, the plateau. We kind of lost our way with our map and compass, and we ran out of water. And it was kind of scary. I mean, because, you know, you, you start picturing, you know, you know dead, dead cow heads and everything. And, you know, it's, 
But the thirst, oh my goodness, because every breath you take, you're breathing out uh, fluids from your lungs. It just sucks the fluid right out of you, and literally you will die without water. In the desert, you will dry out quick. Now, the, the people of Israel were very familiar with desert. They walked through the desert in the wilderness for, for 40 years. The, where, where they lived was very desertous in an arid um, environment, and they couldn't just turn on the tap, right? That, you know, in those days, you didn't just turn the water on. You had to go out and, and get some water and bring it back, and they knew what thirst was, and they knew that where there was water, there was life. Even in the desert, if there was an outspring of water, life sprung up around it. All right, so they're doing this water drying ceremony and the prophecy, and you get in the context of all of this is really important because it's in this context, and this is so importantly powerful. In this context, Jesus stands up. It says in John 7, 37, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty... And they knew what thirst was. We don't, but, you know, kind of get, get your mind there. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now, Jesus isn't talking about a physical thirst. He's talking about a spiritual thirst. Remember, the water-drying ceremony really wasn't about water. It was about the Spirit of God and that spiritual thirst that we all have when God's not in our life. And he goes on. Whoever believes in me is the Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. It's that same picture in Ezekiel 47, that water that flows, starts to flow from the temple, and then it just flows, and more comes, and it just, like it's coming from nowhere, and it just keeps coming, water upon water, not a limited amount of water, an unlimited amount of the Spirit. By this, he meant the Spirit, so John explains what he's talking about here. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Now, what John is referring to there, if you were around for, um, if you were around for Easter, the Spirit of God had not been poured out yet, had not been given to people. Remember, there's this sin problem that exists between God and man. Sin separates us from God. The reason, one of the big reasons Jesus came was to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that our sins could be forgiven, we could be washed clean, and so his spirit could come and live inside of us. So Jesus, what, what John is saying here is Jesus is talking about the spirit. The spirit hasn't been given yet because Jesus hasn't been glorified, and that's what he says. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And glorified is, is how they refer to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, the glorification of Jesus. That hadn't happened yet, all right? So the spirit hasn't been poured out, and the spirit... This, this prophecy truly is fulfilled in the second chapter of Acts, if you want to go and read that, where the Spirit of God is, is given in its fullness to the, the followers of Jesus. So the cross brings forgiveness, which cleans up the home, or it cleans up our hearts, which then makes them eligible to be the home of the Spirit of God who lives inside of us. And where the Spirit is, there is life. You guys following all this? Okay. We're going to get to light, but we've got to start with water. We've got to start with water. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Now, if you've ever read this before, you might have gotten to that sentence and just kind of blown by it because, okay, I mean, why? But when you know the context, when, when you know what Jesus stood up in the middle of and the, and the symbolism and what the, the people of that time understood about that ceremony and about all of that. And Jesus stands up and says, if you're thirsty, come to me for living water. And uh, it's pretty, pretty powerful. Now, what I know about us is there are some of us that are thirsty. There are some of us that are thirsty and we know we're thirsty. You know you're thirsty. And there are some of us who are thirsty and we don't know we're thirsty. Or at least we are able to distract ourselves enough. And that's what we try and do. We distract ourselves with other things. You know, if, if we try and distract ourselves with, you know, the next relationship or 
with success or with security, you know, if I can get enough money put away or, or whatever, and we work towards goals to keep ourselves busy so we don't have to think about the fact that we're thirsty. We, we work hard on looking good on the outside, you know, if I can have the right job and the right car and the right wife or husband or whatever, then, and work towards those things, then I can keep myself distracted from the fact that I am thirsty, spiritually speaking. And there are some of us that are there right now. You know, the amazing thing is, is once you get all those things that I just listed, if you get everything you've ever wanted, you will realize how desperately thirsty you are because how desperately empty all that is without God living on the inside. But Jesus stands up and he says, basically saying, guys, I'm the source of life. I am the source of life. A never-ending flow of water that will quench that thirst in your soul and will come from within. And he's saying you're a spiritual being. You are a spiritual being. Every single one of us is a spiritual being. And you will never be fully alive until the Spirit of God lives in you. If you're thirsty, come to me. And I'll give you water. And that water is the Spirit of God. And, that, and the Spirit of God on the inside will bring you alive not just a little bit of life but life abundantly if you've ever seen water in a desert life just breaks out all around it it can be a desert all around but where that water is there is life and lushness and abundance and animals and and everything and the same thing is true in our lives when we we live in a world that some in some ways is a desert but our lives can be full of life and bring life to the people around us as the water of God flows from us and overflows from our lives to others. Pretty powerful statement Jesus is making here. And this is why they're going, he's got to be the Messiah. I mean, whole, he, this is all tying together. Now, this is really cool. Jesus makes this statement in light of this, this ceremony and, and all of that, and people are like, wow, he's the Messiah, but the religious leaders are still trying to take him out, right? And so this is the exact point. You might remember a few weeks ago, the last week of the sex series, I believe, uh, I talked about the woman who was caught in, a, in the act of adultery. You all remember that? And so this woman is caught by the religious leaders in the act of adultery. Well, this is where that happens, just after Jesus says this. And they drag her in front of Jesus. He's still in the temple courts. This is all one story unfolding. And say, look, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. She deserves to die according to the law of Moses. What do you say? And they're trying to catch Jesus. They're trying to put him in a catch-22. Because if Jesus says, well, yes, we need to enforce the law of Moses and execute her, then he's breaking the Roman law, and the Romans occupied them at that time. And so Jesus would have been in trouble with the Roman government. But if Jesus says, no, let's not execute her, then he is breaking the law of Moses, and so he's going to be in trouble with the people and, and if he makes a statement one way or the other. And this is where Jesus famously says, well, if you haven't sinned yourself, you can throw the first stone. Right? You all re you track me remembering this? Okay, good. And they all walk away because they all know. He, he, he turns it on them, basically, and, and puts them in a position where if, if they throw a stone, now they're in trouble. So... Jesus wins. Checkmate. Um, he's so good, Jesus, you know? But then, he, then he, he, he walks up to the woman and, and looks her in the eyes and says, you know, does anybody condemn you? And she says, nobody's condemning me. He says, well, I'm not going to condemn you either. He forgives her. He forgives her. And then he says, go and sin no more. Go and stop living this way and really what jesus is saying and you got to remember it in light of this water thirst thing you don't have to live this way you don't have to try and fill the empty thirsty place in your soul with another relationship because it will never work it doesn't fill the thirst in your heart now what i love about the fact that that this story comes right after that proclamation and right before the I am the light of the world statement that he's about to make is that I think Jesus circumstantially, experientially is showing who he came to be water for and who he came to be light for. It wasn't just for the people who had their act together. 
It wasn't just for the people who could be moral enough uh, or had been moral enough or just for the people who, who were religious enough. It was for people who had made a mess of their life. It was for people who went the wrong way, stumbling in the dark and, and thirsting and just trying to figure it out and didn't know which way to turn and had made a mess of their lives. And Jesus is saying, I am, come to me. You won't have to walk in darkness. Come to me and you won't have to be thirsty anymore. Then he stands up. We're finally getting to I am the light of the world, right? I am statement. We're there. And he stands up in John 8, verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now this is another profound statement because it's not just made in a vacuum. Again, when we just read this and we don't know the context, it's like, well, that's nice. Jesus is the light of life. Um, but we don't get the context that Jesus is speaking into. Let me ask you, have you ever been in total darkness, anyone? Total darkness, complete and total darkness. It's hard to find. It is very hard to find. One of the places you can find it is in the back of a cave. Uh, I used to take people caving for fun and for a living. Um, and so you get to the, we'd get them to the back of the cave and turn out all the lights... And then it's complete and total darkness. Like you can hold your hand in front of your face like this, and you can't see your fingers. And your eyes start to play tricks on you because it's so dark. And then what we would do is we'd give everybody a handful of wintergreen lifesavers and throw them in your mouth. Anybody know this trick? And then you chew with your, your mouth open. Um, and green sparks come out of the lifesavers. It's like, that can't be good for you, right? Um, <laughs> But in total darkness, it is like, it's all lit up. It's amazing because our eyes adjust and, and that light pierces the darkness. But we don't know darkness. We live in an electric society. When it gets dark, what do we do? We turn on the lights. We turn on our headlights. We get a flashlight. We turn on the light switch. We don't live with darkness. And we can't even find darkness if we want to. Walk out at night on a dark night and you still get light pollution. You can still see it's just a different time. In, in this day and age, if you go up into outer space and take a picture of the earth at night, it looks like this. Yeah, it, it's different. Now, in Jesus' day and age, if you went up into outer space and took a picture of the earth, it looked like this. All right, light was a big deal for them. Light was a huge deal for them. And at night, they went to bed. Now seriously, if it was getting on dark and they were traveling, they would have to find a place to go to bed because there were, there were bears and lions and bandits and you could fall in a hole in the ground. I mean, they could get, light a torch, but that only lasted a little while. And if that went out, you're stuck out there, right? With the lions and the bandits and everything else. It was, it was a big deal before electricity. Well, back to the wandering in the wilderness. They had this... Uh, God showed up in a pillar of fire by night and provided light for them for 40 years. They had light. The rest of the world didn't have that. That was this huge thing. That was God with them. And so to recreate that in their celebration, they had these 75-foot tall lamps that held gallons and gallons and gallons of oil, and they would light them. And they were at the temple, and the temple sat at the top of Jerusalem, all the way at the top of the hill. And they would light these lamps, and they would cast light over the whole city. I mean, it was, it was said that light filled every corner of the city. This would have been stunning in their day and age, because they didn't have spotlights. They didn't, you know, they couldn't light up the football field. They just played during the day. Um, and so they just, they just didn't have it, so everybody just went to bed at night, because it was dangerous at night. But during the festival a party i mean people danced and they sang and they stayed up late and and this was a symbol of god's blessing and god's presence and god's salvation and it was a symbol of the pillar of fire by night you know biblically speaking light represents several things it li it represents the presence of god the pillar of fire represented the presence of god god with his people and um and the, and the presence of God brings us comfort and peace and security. It does. When my kids were smaller, 
they would often ask, uh, they were afraid of the dark. I still am, but um, they were afraid of the dark. And so when it was time for bed, they would say, you know, dad or mom, whoever was putting them to bed, will you just sit, you know, we, we called it snuggling, but we didn't snuggle. We would just sit at the foot of their bed or sit on a chair in their room just to bring peace and comfort and security because when we were present, those things were present. It brings peace to a fearful situation. Um, you ever been in a dark season in your life? If you haven't, you will. Don't worry, it's coming. Um, <laughs> surprise! Um, it's just a matter of time. And you call out, call out to God and say, God, will you come and sit at the end of my bed? God, will you, will you just be present with me? I don't know if you've ever done this before. If you haven't, going through a dark time that's a great thing to pray because when God comes and sits at the end of the bed his presence with you it brings peace it brings comfort it brings security just like my presence to my kids brings peace and comfort and security light when Jesus says I'm the light of the world this part of what he's saying light also chases away fear and anxiety again they were dealing with things in the night that were very real dangers Bandits. I mean, they, people would rob people, and those, those guys would go out at night. Uh, and wild animals, they had bears and lions and all that. That's kind of scary stuff. If you've ever camped in grizzly country, it's kind of scary stuff at night. Grizzlies are higher on the food chain than we are. Um, when, I was, uh, when I graduated from college, my dad and I did this trip to Alaska, and we did a backpacking expedition that lasted uh, 16 hours. Um, <laughs> so... We, we, uh, ro- we rode into Denali Park uh, on the bus, like six hours into the middle of nowhere on the bus, got out, they dropped us off, and we're like, we're all by ourselves out here. Um, we hiked up this valley, and there were no, t- it was just windswept, no trees or anything, and as we're going up this valley, the wind starts blowing, and it's blowing so hard, like gale force winds were leaning into it like this to make, make headway, and we're like, we gotta find a place to set up the tent. Normally, you just set it up in the middle of the valley, but It wasn't going to work. The tent would blow away. We'd blow away. So we found this little spot up in the distance where the the hill kind of dipped a little bit, and there was a place where we could get out of the wind. And so we went up there, and we set up the tent, got everything all ready to go, and then we began to look around, and we realized there were these holes all over the place, like something dug holes. And what it was is grizzly bears had been there digging after ground squirrels, right? So we're in a grizzly bear feeding den. Um... (laughs) But there's nowhere we can go because the wind's blowing 80 miles an hour and it's getting dark and we're like, we're done, we've got to stay here for the night. So we, we rolled out our sleeping bags, a.k.a. burrito shells, and, uh, and crawled in and, uh, and, and didn't sleep a wink. You know, it got dark and we just laid there and we're like, we're going to be eating. All right, well, again, we don't, get, we don't get that. But when it was light the next morning, oh, praise Jesus. It was, it was great. We hiked out of there um, into the face of a volcano. But that's a different story for a different time. Um, I really, really did, actually. It was. But darkness, I mean, darkness represents our anxieties and our fears, our depression. And Jesus says, I am the light of life. When I step into those things, I chase them away. If you walk with me, you won't walk in darkness, he says. Light light helps us see where we're going, too, doesn't it? It's easy to navigate when you can see. Part of their problem was just navigation. They couldn't see. You didn't have a flashlight. You fall in a hole. Ever been at a hotel? In the middle of the night, get up to use the bathroom, and you forgot where they put the, uh, the furniture? And you kick, the, you kick the furniture, and you're like, you hear people cussing all over the hotel because everybody's doing that. Because when you can't see where you're going, it's hard to get around. You can hurt yourself. And in life, the same thing is true. When we can't see, when we're walking in darkness, it's hard to make good decisions, isn't it? It's hard to know which way to go. We end up banging ourselves up pretty good. And Jesus speaks into that, and he says, I am the light of life. It's easy to get around when there's light. It's hard to get around when there's not. Light biblically also represents, just represents God. 
in Acts chapter 26 and verse 17, Jesus is talking to the Apostle Paul here, and he says, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, or the non-Jews, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God. See, Satan's referred to as the prince of darkness, right? Jesus and God are referred to as light, and that's throughout Scripture. God and, and light are synonymous. And, and lastly, light brings life. And we see that throughout the scriptures as well. And we see that through our experience as well, as well don't we? Anybody love winters in the Ohio Valley? Four. All right. Excellent. I see that hand. Is there another? Praise the Lord. All right. So here's how this goes. You know, it gets cloudy in November, right? And, and it, gets, it gets sunny again in the end of April. It's great. Love it. Um, but somewhere around February, everybody's like, I think I can get out of bed. You know, I mean, it's just like that whole seasonal affective thing. We get, we get kind of sluggish and sad. But then you get that warm 70-degree day in February. You know the one I'm talking about? Nobody goes to work because everybody's outside in the sun going, oh, oh praise the Lord. You know, but 20 minutes in the sun, and you feel like a different person. And there's not, I mean, people say, well, it's vitamin D. I can take 30,000 units of vitamin D, and I don't feel the way I feel when I sit out in the sun for 20 minutes. It's powerful. Light brings life to us, and only light. It's the foundation of life. Now, I want to go back a few chapters in the book of John. In John chapter 1, John is, again, trying to reveal who Jesus is. And this is what he says at the beginning. He's, he's trying to paint a picture of who Jesus is. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, as he's, when he says the Word, he's referring to Jesus. So, in the beginning was the Word, or in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. And then in verse 4, he says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. You see how light and life are tied together? It's the foundation. Now, this is really cool. If you go back to Genesis, the first book in the Bible where it talks about the creation of the world, it says this, and it's very similar. In the beginning, wait, John says, In the beginning was the word, Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Let me paint this picture for you for a second. There, we have a, a rock in space called earth. It's darkness, and it's formless, and it's empty, and there is no life, and the Spirit of God is beginning to hover over the surface of the earth, but there's still no life. For some of us, that might be a description of our souls. Formless and empty, and the Spirit of God is starting to draw you, but there's still no life. But then it says, and God said, let there be, does this sound familiar? Let there be light, and there was light. Now, that was the first part. That was the foundation that the rest of creation was built on. Because light is the foundation for life. Ask a farmer. Sun goes out. Everything stops. Light is the foundation for life. Where there's light, there is life. And Jesus is the light of life. He's where we get our source of light. Jesus said, I came to bring life and life in all of its fullness. Light is the prerequisite of life. And Jesus is that light. Now, I'm going to drop down a few verses to verse 9, John 1, 9. And, it, and he goes on about this. He says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world, talking about Jesus, and he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, referring back to Genesis, which we just read, I love how cool the Bible is, the world did not recognize him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That light that gives us life brings us life by pointing us to a relationship with God, the giver of life. Is this all making sense? 
It's, it, it's kind of complicated, but it's so cool. Jesus lights the way to a relationship with God. And it is only in that relationship with God that you will find life for your soul, the life that you're looking for. Now, back to John 8, back to our statement. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever, even you, if you choose to follow Jesus, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light is where life is found. And life is what every one of us is looking for. You know, we think we're looking for happiness. You're not looking for happiness. You're looking for life. You're looking for Jesus. You're looking for his presence in you. And no matter how dark the situation that you face right now is, light wins. It wins every time. When uh, we would go caving, we would go, one cave we went to is outside of Franklin, West Virginia. It was called Senate Cave, really cool cave. We'd go all the way to the back, and there's this huge room, size of a football field, and we would turn the lights off and let people's eyes adjust, and then we would light a candle, and that candle would light up that entire room. Go ahead and drop the lights there, guys. Let your eyes adjust for just a second. See, we can't even get total darkness here, can we? Nope. But we'll get as close as we can. Now I just want to... Look around. Even in the darkest room, even in the darkest night, even when the world looks like it's all going black, just a little bit of light makes all the difference in the world. And guys, we don't have a little bit of light. We have the light of the world. Let's bring the lights back up. There are some of us, we just need to get back in touch with that light. I want to invite you to do that today. And there are some of us that we need to walk from darkness to life. You've never Maybe you've never even known that God wants to come and live in your heart. You've never even known that your sins need to be forgiven, and that's what you've been looking for all this time. But that's what needs to happen. And so I want to invite you to pray with me. Let's just bow our heads, close our eyes. If you need to, to begin that relationship with Jesus, that's where life is found. That's where the light is. That's where the, the water that will quench the thirst of your soul resides. And it just begins with, Admitting you're a sinner and asking for forgiveness and inviting him to come in. So let's just do that right now. You can repeat after me if you've never done that before. Just say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my forgiveness. And I ask that you forgive me now. I choose now to follow you. To walk in your light. And I ask that you would come and live in my heart and lead my life. Quench my thirst and fill me with life in all of its fullness. In your name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed with me and that's the first time you prayed that prayer, let me know on the Connect card. There's a place where you can say, I surrendered my life to Jesus today for the first time. Um, and if you prayed that and it was just a genuine like, yeah, I need to get back to, to God. And, and we kind of consider that a rededication. And there's a place where you can mark that off as well. And I, I encourage you to do that. And I just, just want to be able to pray for you. And, and, um, and yeah, so please let us know before you drop the connect card in the offering. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you that we don't have to walk in darkness, but that we can be in your light. And Lord, that we can reflect your light to the world around us. And I pray as we, as we walk this life out, Lord, that we would be beacons of light to a world that so desperately needs you. And Lord, we would be water stations for, for our friends and our family. 
for the people that we work with and our neighbors, God, who are desperately looking for something and don't even know what it is yet. God, shine your light through us, distribute your water through us, and fill us to overflowing. In Jesus' name, amen.